2 Timothy 3.16 or actually we'll read 2 Timothy 3 verses 13 through to 17 um, this is so uh, the, the last few weeks we've been having a, um, a summer outreach at the Birmingham City Mission and I was asked to deliver a seminar called uh, standing, on the, standing on the Word in Evangelism Standing on the Word in Evangelism uh, I'm going to bring um, Really, I think this is probably going to be split into two parts. I'm going to bring the first part of that this morning um, because I think it's applicable for us as Christians uh, because, you know, we're call, all called to be witnesses for Christ. Um, but really the idea of standing on the word in the Christian life, it's not just about standing on the word to do evangelism, but standing on the word within the Christian life, within the Christian life. So we're going to read from 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 13 through to 17. Paul writes these words to the, uh, the young pastor in training, Timothy. <clears throat> but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's just, um, let's just pray and then we'll bring a few, a few thoughts from our text this morning. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you'd be pleased to speak to our hearts to now, Lord, as we consider your word, the authority of your word. Lord, help us to yield to your word. Lord, this church is called uh, the uh, 116 Bible Church. We want your word to be the, cent the central authority in this place, Lord, and that we would yield to your will that we know through your word. Lord, be with me now. Give me clarity of thought and speech. Open our eyes to see, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Bible, the Bible. Each one of us in this room has either got a Bible in our hands, a hard copy, or we have uh, the new digital uh, Bibles on our phones. Uh, the word Bible um, comes from a, a, an ancient Greek, Koinonian Greek word, la Biblia. La, Bib La Biblia, which means the books, it means the books, a collection of divinely inspired writings, books written over, uh, over 1500 years from start to finish, approximately 40 different authors, uh, written by priests and, and prophets and fishermen, and doctors, ex-tax collectors, shepherds and kings, just to name but a few, 66 books in the, the canonized uh, Bible that we have in Protestant Christianity today. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 of the new books varying in genre from poetic, uh, prophetic, historic, instructive, but all with the central theme of the good news of God. The good news of God coming to save his creatures through his son Jesus Christ. This is the, the central theme of the Bible from start to finish. You know, if you're reading through the Old Testament prophets, they all pointing to Christ. If we're reading uh, through the, the historical narrative of the Old Testament, it's pointing to Christ. Christ is the central theme. He's on every page of the scriptures. Every page of the scriptures. We've just, we've just read in our text today that this word of God, this word is, uh, is given under inspiration. 2 Timothy 3, 16, very well known. A verse given by inspiration of God. That word there means to be, it's where, it's, the root word is theonoustos. It's, it, it means God breathed. It's breathed out by God. The word of God has been breathed out by him uh, to his creatures. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us that the word of God is living and powerful. It's a living word. It's not just some 
um, story that someone wrote down that was in their imagination, but it's a, living God, it's a living word that comes from a living God. It's a powerful word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of men's hearts. It's the revelation cons- from, that's given from God And it's the revelation to us concerning God himself and what he has done. Now the Bible, it is is profitable. It's profitable to us. It's profitable for us. It's profitable, as we've just read, uh, for instruction and training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. But it's not like like a car manual. You know, you'd get a a Haynes car manual and you think, oh, this is going to be profitable for me to know how I fix the car. It's not like that. It's given from God, it's his revelation to us, but it's for his own glory. The primary reason God has given us revelation is not just so that we know how to live, but it's that we may know who he is, that we may know his character, that we may know him and in turn glorify him, uh, glorify him through what he's done for us in his son. God's word is enduringly true through all generations. So no matter what this culture tells you about the Word of God, oh, that's outdated, that's not needed anymore, don't you know we've moved on, the times have moved on, no matter what comes at you, the Word of God is enduringly true from generation to generation. The Word of God transcends culture. If you go to North Korea, they've got a particular culture, they do things in a particular way, very very sadly to say that. Um, well, in some ways, our culture has, has evils that are, that are hidden under the surface, which are also just as tragic and just as diabolical in God's eyes. But the Word of God doesn't change to bend into the culture. It transcends culture. It transcends generational history. It's a word by which souls are saved. Notice in our text today, verse 15, From childhood, he says to Timothy, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. Able to make you wise for salvation. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 it says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living, again here's that living and abiding word of God. The word of God is able to make men and women wise unto salvation. That's why it's so important to be central to our evangelistic endeavours. That's why it's so important for us to share with those around us. That's why it's so important. The pulpit in a church, in the Protestant Reformation, they erected these pulpits in order to, not to put a person on a stage, to, to put a person up there. In fact, the pulpit is actually designed to block the person. It's designed to block the person from the congregation, but so that the word of God would be treated as primacy amongst the people of God. This is the authority within the church. It's his word. So the word of God is able to make a person wise unto salvation. It's also there to sanctify the Lord's people. It's given to us by God. The word of God is given to us, as we've just read, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In John 17, we see this high priestly prayer given by Christ himself. John 17, 17, he said, Lord, sanctify them. Father, sanctify them. Set them apart. Cleanse them. Make them holy. Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is his means by which he sanctifies his people. You see, maybe some of us have sin in our lives. Maybe we're dealing with certain things and then we come to our reading in the morning and we we look square in the mirror of God's word and 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 it corrects us. It confronts us in our sin. It's telling us that we, we're living a certain way which is wrong in the eyes of God. And something's got to change. And let me tell you folks, it's not going to be, the Bible doesn't change. The word of God doesn't change. It's not going to be God. God is not going to change. He is immutable. He's unchanging. And we are the ones that need to change. All of us in here, me more than most, we need to change. We need to grow in Christ likeness. We need to be conformed into the image of Christ. And it's through his word 
that that takes place by the Spirit. There have been kingdoms that have fallen. and be, There's been kingdoms that have fallen and been established and governed under the Word of God. There are men and women all over the world today who are still being persecuted for even just possessing some part or full version of the Scriptures in their own hands. We know of saints in various places in this world that are having to even memorize portions of scripture. What a wonderful blessing in some ways. So that if they're imprisoned, they've got some, you know, something of the word of God has been stored in their own hearts. The word of God is a, it's the most widely read and sold book worldwide. I think John 3.16 has been translated into hundreds and hundreds of different languages. I think out of all the English uh, language, John 3.16 uh, has been, or, or out of any, any historical document, should I say, John 3.16 has been translated into mo the most languages worldwide. It's the most widely sold book. There's many whose blood has been shed uh, for us to hold in our hands and to, to have what we have today. Some of you may have heard of William Tyndale, uh, a man who translated the scriptures, the New Testament into English. And uh, he was burnt, uh, strangled and burnt at the stake. And uh, his prayer was, um, Lord, uh, uh, open the eyes of the king. And then in just a few short years after his execution, uh, Henry VIII made it um, compulsory that every parish should have a, a, a translation of the scriptures in English to share with the parishioners and God, God answered that prayer you see men's blood has been shed on what we have in our hands today over the over the centuries gone by you may have heard of the the Protestant Reformation and the five solas the first one of the five solas is sola scriptura uh, God, by God's word alone that the word of God is sufficient for all matters pertaining to life and godliness and Christian, Christian living. The word, it's the word that has taken men's consciences captive for millennia. There was um, a, a German, you may have heard of uh, Martin Luther, the German, he was a Catholic monk and he came out of the Catholic Church. He was one of the, pi the spearhead pioneers for the Reformation and... Um, he was being taught certain things in the Catholic Church which contradicted the Word of God, very, very, uh, very deeply contradicted the Word of God. He understood, uh, God showed him as he read through the book of Romans and various uh, parts of the scripture, he understood that justification, as we spoke about last week, was based upon um, something that God does. It's a free gift from God. It's not about doing all these different religious traditions and these practices, all these indulgences and so on and so forth but God, it is God who justifies so he began to see the Word of God and it contradicted what, he'd be, what he was being taught within his established religious um, tradition and then he was taken to something known as the Diet of, of Worms which was in uh, uh, just south of Frankfurt Germany in 1521 and uh, there's this famous uh, quote as he's being challenged by Charles V uh, I'm just going to read it to us. Luther replied concerning his doctrine and the chain and, and the and um, the scriptures, the scriptural revelation that he had received. He said, "If then I am not convinced by proof from holy scripture or by cognate reasons, I am not satisfied by the very text I have cited. And if my judgment is not in this way brought into subjection to God's word." I neither can nor, nor will retract anything because they were asking him to recant, to retract his, his perspective, his new views from scripture. He said, for it cannot e be either safe or honest for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. God help me, amen. This was a very famous quote of Luther's. But the idea here is that unless his conscience is captivated by the word of God, unless, he's, unless, unless he sees what, what is being taught in scripture, then he can't retract his statements concerning justification by faith alone. And praise God that he didn't retract, because Luther was one of the men, amongst many others, that was used by God to spark the Protestant Reformation, and the word of God went, went like wildfire across Europe. And many people don't realize what we have in modern day culture, Western culture today was as a result of God. It was really a revival. It was a revival of truth. 
It wasn't just academic head knowledge. God, by his spirit, lit a fire in Europe. And it was based and rooted in the truth of his word. The word of God is the root of all truth. So a word that is to be experienced, a word that's to be experienced. As I mentioned, this may split into two parts. So I'm just going to keep going time-wise and see how far, we, we, I won't take it, I'll, I'll aim to maybe split this into two parts if we can, but it's a word to be experienced. There is something experiential in the Christian faith. Our, the church name, it's not on the, not on the wall now, 116 Bible Church, it, that's derived from Romans chapter 116. For we're not ashamed of the gospel. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. It is the, the gospel of Christ, the euangelion, which I've shared about before. This idea means the good news. And this word centers around the good news of Jesus. Right from Genesis, right from the very beginning of the scriptures, even when you, when you see God say, let there be light, you have a picture here of the light of the world is going to come. Genesis chapter 3, you see this, you see this um, w wonderful promise, what's known as the Proto-Euangelion, the first gospel. The first gospel was actually preached by God himself. God spoke the first message of good news as he pronounced a curse on the serpent and he said, I, I will put enmity between the woman's seed and between your seed and he, and he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. You have a picture there of the cross of Jesus as Jesus' heel was being bruised at the cross, the enemy using that and thinking that he had defeated Christ, but in that very action, in that very motion, Christ disarming the powers of darkness and, and uh, winning for himself a people for his own glory. But this good news, it's the power of God. Now that word there, power, in the Greek is, is, what, is, is the word dunamos. Dunamos, it's the power, it's the dunamos of God unto salvation. It's where we get the word dynamite from. It's where, it's where the word dynamite uh, comes from. It derives its uh, name from. Now you could see these um, old, old fashioned footage of these folk that were using dynamite to blow holes in the side of mountains in order to mine for gold in the olden days. It was something of an explosion, something that was deeply powerful. Deeply powerful. And this is the picture that Paul's using here, that the gospel is God's dynamite. It's his dynamite power unto salvation. It's explosive. It's something powerful about it. There's an experience that's attached to being, being um, saved, uh, hearing and believing the gospel. But also as Christians, as we read the word, there's something experiential that the Lord does in our hearts by his spirit. Salvation is to be experienced. If we're here today and we're claiming to be Christians, there must be something of that experienced power of God in our lives. There must be something of that in our lives. Now, I appreciate some of us may have been brought up in the church and we grow. I, I heard someone use the illustration once of a, a, of a light switch on a wall. You have e either the light switch that you flick on and off, or you have a dimmer switch. And sometimes, sometimes people's faith, it can be like that dimmer switch. It's just come on gradually over their life, over the years. We don't quite know when, but, but it's something of the power of God that's working in their lives. Something of hearing the gospel and looking on to Jesus Christ. Now for some of us, we may, we, we may have been so deeply entrenched in darkness that when we get saved, it's like, it's like the light being flicked on, being switched on. It's a complete um, distinction. Some people can know the day and the time and the moment when God uh, really opened their eyes to the gospel. But there must be something in our lives of coming from darkness unto light. There must be something in our lives where our affections are changed to no longer love sin to no longer have an indifference towards God, but something of becoming a new creation in Christ, having a newfound love towards him and towards his word. For those who were here last week, we were looking at Ephesians chapter 2, where it says about you have been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
You see, when you get saved, you get cre- what does that mean to be created in Christ Jesus? We're joined, we're brought into union with Christ. We're brought into a, a, a relationship with him that wasn't the case prior to that salvation. And there's a change that occurs. Now, I've used this illustration before. It's not my illustration, so do forgive me. It's, I heard another pastor use this, but I think it's a good one. If I turned up to church today, and I, I, and I walked in, I was a bit, let's say everyone was already here, I walked in, it's 11 o'clock, and I'm like, really sorry I'm late, I'm so sorry I'm late, I, I was on my way this morning, and um, I noticed there was a noise on my car, so I, I pulled over, I got out of the car, I went around the, the, the um, off side of the vehicle, and I got hit by a lorry, a 16-wheeler lorry on this A449, it dragged me about 300 meters down the road. I went under the wheels twice, and it, um, it, it just dragged me down. It threw me 50 feet over a hedge, but I managed to run the rest of the way, and I'm here. And if I'm standing before you, pristine white shirt, not out of breath, not a mark on me, you would say Pete's either completely lost it or he's just telling a lie. He's just he's just lying to us. You see, but there are people who say that they have had an encounter with the living God and yet have not been changed. You cannot have an encounter with the living God without being changed, without something happening to you that changes you, that starts to make you look different in a certain way. You start to act differently, you start to speak differently to that which we used to, uh, to, to that which we used to do. When a person is born again, the Bible uses this language of becoming a new creation, a new creature. The old things pass away and all things become new. If you've grown up through your life loving sin and just still continuing in that condition, but yet we come to church and we give a mental assent to certain truths, but we haven't had that inward change, then the Bible says that we're still dead in our sin. We need to be born again and given those new affections that God can give. The reason I bring this up, and I, like I said, I was sharing this seminar to a bunch of evangelists who we were about to go out onto the street, and there's a real interesting, I, I believe, personally, one of the main reasons, it, from, if we're going to apply it evangelistically to our lives, one of the re- main reasons for, firstly, no evangelism whatsoever. People who don't ever really want to tell anybody about Jesus. Often, now I understand that there could be Christians that that maybe you're dealing with fear of man or we want to operate wisely in the workplace. There's times where we haven't got to be continually just hammering away at that gospel nail with people all the time. There should be times when we, when we do stand up and we do speak. But one of the reasons why many professing Christians don't actually share the word of God and share the gospel, in some cases, and more often than not I believe, is because they haven't experienced that saving power in their own life in their own life. You see, it, that experience should drive us to go and tell others, uh, like the Apostle Paul says, we believe, therefore we speak. There's something attached to that experience that you've had in your own life that causes you to trust the gospel and its power. When you've experienced the power of the gospel, there's, there's something in that that causes you to trust the word of God. You don't need to add to it, you don't need to take away from it. If you've experienced that power, and therefore you go and share the good news because you know that that power can save people, that God uses that message to save people by the power of the gospel. So one reason why evangelism is often not done is because the professing believer has not experienced the power of the gospel and therefore doesn't trust the gospel as they go and share with others. And then not just maybe those who never share the good news, but maybe those who have... A different approach to sh- that maybe maybe it's they they, they share but they, they do things but it's not necessarily the gospel again there's lots of activity and I bring this out a lot because it's very very prevalent I think it does need to be brought out there is a lot of activity that goes on in the name of Christ today that's actually not it's not the gospel it's not it's not the message of Christ being shared with those around us it's pragmatic events and pragmatic schemes and pragmatic initiatives that have no gospel content attached to them at all. Now there's a time and a place, as we were sharing earlier, about being salt and light in the world. 
you know, there's events we can put on, there's things we can do to, to show the community where the church is at, as we were discussing earlier. But at some point, we've got to share the good news, which is God's power unto salvation. So do we know this power in our lives? Do we know this saving power of the gospel in our own lives? There are people out there today who profess to know Christ and yet they've not experienced the power of God's saving word in their lives. It's the rocky ground. The, the seed falls on the rocky ground, it gets snatched away. They come into church, a person can come into church week after week and hear the word and it gets snatched away. Or the thorny ground that chokes out the word. The stony ground which when persecutions come for the name of Christ they fall away. There's people that may even be able to quote the word. You know the devil can quote the word of God. Quoting the word of God doesn't necessarily mean someone is converted. It doesn't mean that they're saved. And there's false conversion all over this world today. There are people sitting in pews all over this world today that think that they're Christians because they, maybe they prayed a prayer once. Maybe they said a prayer. Maybe, maybe they signed their name in their Bible on a certain time when an evangelist told them that they were a Christian because they, because they said yes to Jesus. But they've not truly been born again of the incorruptible word of God. And therefore trusting the word of God in light of this new birth. But when we speak about the experience of the Christian life, it must be an experience that's harnessed in truth. It's got to be an experience that's harnessed in truth. The Christian life is experiential. It's one of experience, but it's not subjective. It's not just open. It's not just open for interpretation. It's harnessed in a truth. It's harnessed in the truth who, who came amongst us, the one who's the way, the truth, and the life. It's harnessed in the truth of the gospel. There's many people in this world that have spiritual experiences. You go and speak to a Mormon and they'll tell you about the experience they had with God. You speak to a Jehovah's Witness, they'll tell you about, or the Mormons speak about the burning in the bosom. And they've had these spiritual experiences. Jehovah's Witnesses, again, they've had experiences, very powerful experiences. But they're still dead in sin. See, spiritual experiences aren't always necessarily the indicator that someone is walking in the truth. There's lots of people that have spiritual experiences all the time. It doesn't mean that they're walking in the truth. Now testimonies, Christian testimonies can be very powerful. But even a testimony isn't the determining factor as to whether someone's truly born again. I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones, he used to actually positively um, discourage testimonies being shared at baptisms because what it would do sometimes, it would, firstly it could put doubts in the minds of other people. People's testimonies are different. People's experiences of conversion are different. And sometimes what, what one person experiences isn't necessarily what another person experiences. So what the danger is when we give our testimony, we can be comparing our own experience with other people's experiences. And that's not necessarily a healthy thing to have happen. I remember a pastor once talking about, you know, sometimes you'd get people come into the church and they'd, be, they'd have this amazing experience of God's saving power, this wonderful testimony. Six months down the line, they've fallen back, they're into the world, evidence that they were never converted in the first place. Then you get some people who come in and they don't know the time or the date, but they're looking to the Lord and they grow and they grow and they're, they're, they're leaping on in, in leaps and bounds in their Christian faith. Because it's not about our experience, it's about the truth that our experience is harnessed in the truth of Christ, the truth of the gospel. It's not just have we experienced God's saving power, but are we rooted in God's word? And that's something to remember as well. When you, I brought this up in the evangelistic context. When you're dealing with non-believers and people will tell you, oh, I, I experienced this or I experienced that, we need to realise a person's experience is not the determining factor as to where they are. It's the word of God. What are you trusting in? What is your trust in today? So it's a word to be experienced. It's a word of authority. A word to yield to. 
Hundreds of times, both in the Old and the New Testament, we see this phrase, the word of God, the word of the Lord, the law of God being used time after time. As I've mentioned, this is God's word. It comes from God. It's his revelation to his creatures. And it finds its source in the one who has all unrivaled power and authority. Therefore, in essence, it carries its own self-attesting authority with it. It comes from God, who's the one who has all authority. Therefore, it has the authority of God attached to it. In essence, that's what it is. When, we were, um, when I was in the police, we used to go out on warrants, and we would, we would take warrants out to arrest people. And, you know, that warrant would carry the authority of Her Majesty's police service. So you'd go, you'd be able to have access to people's properties because you've got a warrant with you. You take that with you. That warrant carries the authority of the, of the power behind it. And this word carries the authority of God because it's from God himself. Now Christ is the one, as we read about earlier in Hebrews, that God has spoken to us in these last days by his Son. He is the Word becoming flesh and tabernacling amongst us. He's the one who taught with authority. He came and he, 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 he ministered with authority. He taught with authority. And he has risen uh, into heaven and he's been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He's the living Word. And this is a word which is to be received and obeyed. It's to not only be experienced, but it's to be obeyed within the Christian life. We as Christians are called to submit our lives to the word of God, to the will of God. And how do we know the will of God? Well, again, by his word. So we need to receive his word. We need to receive it. So how do we read the Bible? How do we receive the word of God? Now, I'm not talking about... What do you do? Do you get up in the morning? Do you read a few chapters? Do you, some people maybe read it on the evening? Whenever, whenever it would be. I'm not talking necessarily about how you do it, but what is the state of your heart as you come to the Word of God? I remember once I had a friend who said, you know, he was, he was, he was not a believer, and he was saying, yeah, I've read the Bible. I've read the Bible, read it through twice. But he, had no, he didn't have the lenses to see. He had no humility in his heart. He didn't see it with meekness. He didn't come to the Bible in, in a humility, yielding to its authority. In James chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, it says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So James there encourages people, encourages the Christians to receive the word with meekness. There should, be, there should be something of a humility and a brokenness as we come to the word. Isaiah 66 verse 2, But on this one will I look, God says, To this one will I look, on he who is poor and contrite in spirit, and who trembles at my word. Do you tremble at the word of God? As you read through the word of God, what, is, it, is it just so you can tick the list for the day? Or is it something of a tremble? You know, it would be better for you to read three verses and to tremble at God's word than to read three chapters and to consider it, in, you know, to be indifferent about what we're reading. I say that to me as much as any of us in here. You see, it's not so much a case of us mastering the word of God, but the word of God mastering us. That we would be mastered by the word of God. We need to read it with humility, brokenness, gratefulness in our hearts. Here's the God of the God of creation, the God of heaven and earth, revealing something to us. I heard a preacher once say, you know, it, it filled him, when he got converted, it filled him with fear to think that there was something that God has said that he hasn't read yet. There's something in here that God has said that he hasn't read. And that's a good, that's a good a attitude to have. If we haven't read it through, I'd encourage you to read through the Bible. Just work your way through it. This is God's revelation to us. It's to be obeyed. It's to be obeyed. Let us be obedient to the word of God out of a love for Christ because he first loved us. That must be our, that must be our motivation for yielding our will to God. It's because Christ loved us and gave himself for us. 
What did Jesus say? John 14, 5. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If we are a people who claim to love Christ, then we would keep his, commandment, his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. And in order to know his commandments, we, we need to read, we need to understand what it is he's commanded us from his scriptures. We don't want to be hypocrites. I've, I've, I've spoken on this several weeks ago now. The idea of a hypocrite, a stage player, a very dangerous place to be. To be hypocrites, that we would be indifferent to the things of God, that he would have no bearing upon us as Christians, as his people. If we go out and we're in the workplace and we're telling others about the need for turning from sin, the need for turning to Christ, and yet we're not turning from sin and we're not turning to Christ, playing games with those around us, telling people how they need to be set free from sin only, only to be in bondage to sin ourselves, that's the epitome of hypocrisy. And we know that that's a real danger. If we're, if we're called as Christians to be playing the hypocrites, it's a danger to other people. That there's souls that are at stake here. If there are people coming into the church here and they're seeing us live in ungodly ways, that can be really dangerous for people's souls. May we be a people that are filled with love for one another as the Bible directs us to love one another as he has loved us. And we, we would be known by all men as his disciples with our love for one another. We want to be filled with the word of God so as not to be hypocrites in the world around us. You know, we, our families, our unsaved loved ones, they want to, we want them to see us operating in a biblical way. That they would see us obeying the will of God in our own lives but that we would be useful vessels, that we would be useful vessels. And we've, again, we've spoken about the idea of being a useful vessel recently as well. As we continue to grow in the knowledge of God's word, we begin to grow in our understanding of his will for our lives, and we submit and yield our lives to his will. And through this, we're made into useful vessels. If you want to be a useful vessel for God, if you want to be used by God, you need to be a holy vessel. You need to be obedient to the will of God. Second Timothy, just a, few, just a chapter earlier, he says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honour, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Let us be a people that know the word of God and the word of God has dealt with us, that we would that we would not be hypocrites before those around us, that we would be useful in this great commission work that he calls us to, that we would be able to share the word with others, and that will be part two, we'll speak about the idea of sharing the word with those around us. But before we can go and share the word, it needs to deal with us personally. <clears throat> that, we, that we would be useful vessels for God, that we would be fruitful in the work that he's called us to. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 15, just as I come to a close now. <clears throat> and I'll just read from verse 1 to 8. We want to be a fruitful people. Do you remember what we, um, again, I, I just touch on that verse that we spoke of in Ephesians 2 last week about being created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. That we need to abide in Christ. Verse 1 to 8, the Lord says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. 
Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they are gathered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified <clears throat> that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. <clears throat> Jesus says there, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You see folks, if you wanna, in order to abide in Christ, we need to be in his word. We need to be rooted in his word that his words would abide in us, that we would be fruitful as a branch that is attached to the vine is fruitful. You know, if you walked in a, a vineyard and you see a branch that's just on the floor, there's going to be no fruit that's coming off that branch. That branch is going to be taken, it's going to be thrown into the fire. But we as the people of God are branches connected to the vine of Christ. And really, this is, this is our number one priority in our life. If there's nothing else that you take away from the message this morning, please take away this. Your number one priority, my number one priority, is to be abiding in Christ. Because if you do not abide in Christ, then there's going to be no fruit. There's going to be no fruit in your life. We want to be a fruitful people. How do we abide in him? Through our, we, we haven't spoken much about prayer this morning, but through prayer through fellowship with his people, but ultimately living in his word, that we would be living in the word of God, that we would be a people. I hope, I hope that's been some encouragement this morning, just with regards to the word of God in our own lives, that we would be a people who are governed by this, by this revelation. We have it in our English language. There's different languages. God has supernaturally inspired it. It's been breathed out by God. The original autographs were inspired by God, but God has also supernaturally preserved his truth through the centuries. The Bible says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. God's word is unchanging. It's, it's, it's not affected by culture. It doesn't bend to the culture. And it's preserved eternally for us to come to know him and to know what he's done for us in his son. May we be a people that are abiding in his word, abiding in Christ, that we would be useful for God. May we share it with those around us. We'll talk a bit more about that another week, maybe. May we share the word of God and the gospel with those around us in our lives. If you're not, if you're not reading it regularly, I'd encourage you to daily take up and read. It's food for the soul. You know, when we, when we eat our physical food, you, you don't just... You don't just wait a week and then gorge for like an hour once a week. You get up, you have a bit in the morning, you have something in the afternoon, you have your main meal in the evening. That's with the Bible. I don't want to even equate it to, to just eating physical food in one sense, but that's the way we need to approach this. We need to come to the Lord. It's better, it's better for us to just, just to know his will for us from a few verses than it is to just ferry through it all and not, not give any consideration as to what he's saying to us. So just a few thoughts for us there as a people. May we as a church be governed by the word of God. Hopefully you've experienced the power of God in the gospel and that, that experience, that new, that new birth that the Lord has rendered in our hearts, may it compel us. What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians 5? He says, the love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ compels me. That's not his love for Christ. That's Christ's love for him. So may we be compelled by the love of Christ as he went to that cross and gave his life for us. So just a few thoughts there this morning for us to consider as we bring our time to a close. Let's... Um